Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. This is Chris Ferguson, your host of You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? It has always been a dream of mine to showcase people who have taken their dreams, their ideas, and turned it into their realities. As they reach beyond their personal struggles, their pains or traumas, so many people give up. They lose hope. There are those few who can walk through their obstacles, walk past their challenges, not knowing where it's going to take them. They just trust themselves enough not to give up. They do the follow through in their personal life, their career, and in their relationships. This is what I call an everyday champion. Today's my guest is uh, Katana Malawinski. Nailed it, nailed it, and and I was more concerned about the first name, not the last name. But I, it, um, but she's an amazing individual, and she has a very, very diverse story that I think a lot of people can resonate with. So let's bring Katana in. Good morning. Good morning, Chris, and thank you so much for having me here with you. Oh, I'm ex honored and excited to have you here today. Um. Being in law enforcement for 40 years, I have seen all the bad things that people can do to human beings. And the reason why I created this podcast was to showcase the everyday person who goes through so much and can overcome whatever obstacles have placed in their life. Can you start with your, your backstory about what you went through? Yes. Um, so... I grew up mentally, physically, and sexually abused. I've been through three rapes and actually experienced systemic abuse, primarily in the educational and judicial system. Yet it was a teacher and a police officer as mm -hmm. to why I am here today. They became mentors. And um, then I went through later in life as a young adult, young parent, early in my marriage, my first marriage, I went through 22 years of psychotherapy and I stuck with the marriage that I was told to, to get out of. It was toxic, but I, I didn't recognize the difference between physical abuse and emotional abuse. Mm. So I, you know, I did what society said, you know, stick it out, make it work. You, you know, marriage is difficult and it's hard. Yes. And there does come a point where you have to say, this isn't good for anybody. And, mm -hmm. and I don't blame my ex-husband and I don't blame myself. It was two people that didn't, didn't recognize their own hurts and what it was bringing to the table. I get that. So, I get that. So that's, that's where that backstory came in. And um, yeah. Hmm. You talk about losing everything when COVID hit. How did, what was the everything and, and how did COVID affect your, your business, your life? Oh my, forgive me if I get a little emotional here. Um, Take a I breath. Did. It's okay. I lost everything. I lost, mm -hmm. I was driving, uh, I was doing Lyft Uber and Uber Eats. That was my life. I was building a nonprofit organization <laughs> and learning that process by the ropes. Yeah, it turns out I was doing it backwards, but the heart was in the right place. Um, I lost my house. I lost my car. I lost my jobs. I lost my, my nonprofit. I lost family members that will not talk to me now because I, I got remarried and I moved. Mm. I had friends that were very close to me. Just, I lost a lot. I mean, I lost thousands of people out of contact and it was hard. It's been difficult. And I was on the pandemic unemployment assistance because I was a gig worker. So mm. I didn't qualify for unemployment. Mm. And I knew that was going to come to an end at some point and I thought about it and then I had some help with that thought process, but um, 
there was a prompting and a nudging. And I said, you know what? I think I need to invest in myself mm. and help people with this gift that I have. And that was the beginning. So tell me about the nudges and the promptings. Who, one, did that? Or two, what kind of epiphany? Because I know there's a deeper backstory here because I'm not, I'm sure it's not someone saying, hey, you need to think about this or hey, you need to think about that. I think it was more spiritual, wasn't it? Did I lose you, Katana? I'm here. Okay, you're you're you were frozen. Did you did you hear my question? You said there was a little bit deeper backstory, and then I'm I, we froze. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about that backstory on that nudging and that uh, um, pushing of you to speak on this or change your your ideas of what you are? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry, the emergency. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, just so all my viewers know, Katana lives close to the tornadoes that just occurred. She was actually in the path of the tornado. Luckily enough, her house wasn't hit. But the whole experience was probably extremely, extremely terrifying, horrific, and absolutely emotionally derailing. So just bear with us bear with us she's in a she's in this area where they're still trying to find people they're still trying to dig through debris so it's okay katana it's okay we'll walk it we'll walk it thank you um so on the backstory the first nudging that i had was when i was in the photography well i was in the art program at the university of nevada reno and I was doing all of the arts, but in particular, the, uh, the photography sequence that I was going through. And I was in the advanced part. I was in my final semester. And I was working on a project for myself about my history. And I was trying to go at it in all these other ways that, that didn't actually express what I needed to express. Uh, my professor had me turn the camera on myself. And that was when I created a process unknowingly <laughs> that I would now be implementing to help others. Um, but actually, that moment that beyond that, the next nudge would be when I was having a panic attack in the middle of the canned vegetable aisle at the local store there in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> and I'm fighting myself. I'm having, you know, my heart's pounding and my muscles are getting tense and I'm feeling like I want to cry. I'm paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And it's because I'm being triggered by a can of veg all is something that was related to the PTSD. And I'm thinking I had 22 years of therapy. Why is this still happening? Mm -hmm. And that was when I discovered that process was after that. And I was like, no more, this has got to stop. And it did help. The second nudging to getting into the business where I'm at now mm -hmm. came from Rhonda Britton. She is my life coach. Mm -hmm. And we had a personal conversation and she asked me, well, why aren't you using that? And I said, well, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> and then I had several many, several more nudges that came through the, you know, through the divine actually, and mm -hmm. it came in as downloads and it started as an avalanche after she asked that question. And I put my work out for everybody to see. And I knew all along I wanted to help people. And I knew I wanted to use my art and then all of these combinations <laughs> together created this beautiful process that I've been able to help people with. That's amazing because a lot of people don't listen to that divine nudging. And I knew there was, there was something more to this, this backstory, but a lot of people don't realize that those stories, there's so many people that go through the same things. There's so many people who have gone through childhood traumas, who have been sexually abused or molested or physically harmed or abandoned. 
And so <clears throat> to that, I honor you to be able to speak of it. Thank and you. when you can disassociate your emotions from it, it becomes your foundation. And I, I know you're still working on it, but right now is just a real emotional time where you're at and <clears throat> what you've just been through in the, in, in the, like the last 40 hours, maybe yes. not even probably 30 hours. Yeah. Um, it has probably been a lot of triggering for you of unfinished business of other things, but it was this incident that is triggering you. Triggering me. I'm not sure. With being emotional, with being um, on that oh, side. Yeah. Helping the, the trigger comes more in recognizing that I have been blessed to have two amazing people, actually more now. So many amazing people come into my life and prop me up and say, you know what, you've got something and you're, you are special. You are great and whole the way you are. And um, so I got, I, I get emotional. Like when you said you were in law enforcement, because I do have a lot of respect for that. Thank you. I, I, I thank you for that. Yeah. And I just, I feel like there's a, a disconnect in our society at this particular moment with how important law enforcement is. And I, I would like to bridge that at some point. It's, it's happening. It's happening. The thing is, is that so many leaders in our country at the time um, tried to make it a law enforcement issue when in fact, law enforcement is responsive. Right. If you were to dial 911 or order a pizza in a big city, I bet you the pizza make it, makes it there faster. Yeah. And it's not because the police don't want to respond. They're so busy dealing with all kinds of incidents. But again, they're responsive. They show up when they're called. They don't look for things on the, unless they're looking for stolen cars or different things like this or a high crime area. They're noticing behaviors. So with that, there was a lot of things that didn't come out. And it started back in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And they claimed he was shot. But five of those shots was inside the squad car, the that officer was fighting for his life. They were in, his weapon was being discharged from his holster in his hip as he's trying to fight with that Michael to get his weapon out to defend him. But that was inside the car. But none of that made it out. But they took, the, the media then took that and turned it. So even when the medical examiners, and then they got that big guy from Michael Biden from, or Biden from uh, that medical examiner saying, oh, well, this was homicide. But at that point, he was a paid individual and not a unbiased opinion. And so when he finally looked at it and said, hey, listen, this, this, isn't, this isn't a homicide. This guy was defending his life. That's when the family abandoned him the medical examiner when he finally came out and told the truth. So unfortunately the political issues or political people in our country is what started this whole switch is trying to say that the blacks were being unrightfully addressed. Let me just say in every profession, I'm not going to say cops aren't bad. There is good and bad in every profession. Mm -hmm. And 90, 80, 90% of all professions will go along with whatever the administration of that department says, just like in government, yes. you're going to have that 5% bad and that 5% good, no matter what that's leadership. And that's how leadership can make a difference. Yes. But when you change the dynamics and you allow your city, your state to just placate to a certain race or culture, it becomes a problem because everybody is a citizen that's a citizen of this country d deserves equal opportunities, just like women in law enforcement. It's a man's world. Just know that it's a man's world. And it was very difficult. Yes. So I, you know, when I started 
back in in the 80s so we're talking some some time here so there wasn't a whole lot of women in law enforcement but i met an amazing woman who was in law enforcement in the 50s and it was even more de- even more difficult for her yeah. however she walked that path so i could walk it later she walked those miles so that when i put on those shoes i could walk my miles and that's how we as women can empower ourselves with other women to understand that like with you and, and everything you're going through or went through in your life, it was like somebody else in your world or even a past life, you have walked this mile. You just didn't learn the lesson completely. So you lived it again. Mm-hmm. And that's what deja vu is. Yeah. So what are some of your other guests and talents? Katana. Oh my gosh. I have uh, <laughs> worn many hats. I even was running for state senator before COVID hit. And mm-hmm. that, that kind of sidelined that. But I have a master's degree in legal studies. I did go to law school briefly. Um, I have, I'm, well, I mean, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I play seven different instruments. I'm a writer. I um, love the outdoors. I love to spend time at the beach and go camping. Um, I speak. Okay. I just, I need to interrupt you here. Where, where you live, do you have a beach? I'm just asking, because I know what state you live in. <laughs> yeah, this is when I was in California. Or oh, even okay. I was, I was going to say, wait a minute. Not unless you built yeah. your own beach on one of the lakes or rivers over there. I'm not that far from you. I need to come check this out. Yes, I have beachfront property for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, uh, the first 25 years of my life was in California. I was born and raised in California. And that's where I experienced most of the experiences. I had a hard time when I lived in Oklahoma with, with my family. Mm. Uh, did And so all of these experiences are what, you know, kind of led to, when my discovered this process that allowed me to gain my regain, regain, reclaim my inner strength. Mm -hmm. But it really took listening to those downloads and the divine and the messages that were being sent over and over and over. It's like, how much do I need to tell you? (laughs) This is what you need to do. And I've had those conversations with the divine also. I'm just saying. (laughs) I've had three near death experiences and I, every time I show up, he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, dude, you called me here. I'm here because of a reason. And he's like, no, you're not. You're not supposed to be here right now. I said, listen, I don't have nine lives. I don't have nine lives. So we need to get this, this figured out. And then I get palm pumped at that point back down here to the earth on the 3d. And I'm like, Oh no, I want to stay. And that resonates with me. I, I had a near death experience at the age of 13 Mm. and then I died three years ago. My heart was stopped and restarted. So I'm, I'm still a young and now according to, to the books, but um, an old soul that needs to, to learn those lessons and Mm -hmm. bring the gift to others so that they can learn their lessons. And um, I use, I use my art process in helping people heal. I'm a transformation art and wellness strategist. Mm. So I use that process combined with life coaching skills to help them reclaim their inner strength so they can live with more joy and peace in their lives. That's amazing. I love, I love that story because it's when we, so many people that have been through traumas and pains are givers, Yeah. but how, how, how much do you allow to be received? from others that is a work in progress (laughs) that is a work in progress and I just went through a three-day training with uh, my business coach actually that I believe really transformed that Mm. into recognizing because I think that's that's what happens is that we build these blocks through our traumas and through our life experiences that don't really allow us to see 
what it is that we need to see and experience what we need to experience and receiving has definitely been that difficult patch. Mm -hmm. Now I get it. I, I had that aha moment this weekend and I'm, I will be forever grateful. And I get to pass this along to my granddaughters. That's where it starts. That's where it's authentic. That's where it helps break the chain yes. to all of that. And most people don't realize, and I want to honor you for this, is that when you change your life from what it was to what it is now, you break the chain of karma. You break the chain of karma of the past, not only yours, but your entire family's karma. And you break the chain of the future of any karma to come because there is such a thing called generational karma. Yes. And once you break that chain by changing those behaviors, by having that understanding and, and uh, receiving that information and accepting it, you break the chain going forward. I was that person in my family. There was several of us, but we were so separated because I grew up in an orphanage mm -hmm. and there was six of us and we were all separated because of our ages. And my brothers, there were, I had four brothers, three in one building, one in another. And I, my sister and I, she was five, I was eight, but she was down in the, another section of this building where I was in another section. So all of a sudden we had to be standalone and all of a sudden had to learn to defend ourselves. Yeah. And, and at eight that I had a lot of anger. So I, I get it. However, it doesn't have to define you. And I love that it hasn't defined you because so many people don't go and see that there's opportunities out there or there are things that you can challenge yourself to walk through. I'm sure with panic attacks, it wasn't the first one you had. I'm sure you've had several of them. And so getting walking through those and coming out the other side and seeing that, oh, man, I survived that because a panic attack, you think it's the world's coming to an end. It's Armageddon. You know, there's it's that. So. It, it's a, it's an amazing transformation that you go through and that you have gone through. And most people don't understand that transition in life. What are you doing now as far as as far as your art? Do, do you paint intuitively? Do you paint um, what you see from your client's perspective or what you interpret from their in, uh, in their perspective? I, yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> I, when I create art and yes, I would say it's, except for when I was in school, it was a hundred percent, it's a hundred percent intuitive. So it's what comes to me first. I, I'm not good with a blank canvas and then have somebody go, okay, now put something on there. Okay. It's kind of like when you're writing a story and you've got that blank screen or that blank piece of paper. It's like, okay, so what word do I start with? You know, you get that block. And, but when I, when I get the intuition, I see the images, I see the textures, I see the colors. Um, and sometimes they're my own and sometimes they're influenced by other people. And I have found that even through my educational process, so when I went into legal studies, when I got my master's degree in legal studies, the understanding of law mm -hmm. and the defense of people or the non-defense of people, because there's a lot of holes in our system mm -hmm. that still need to be filled or even just re-examined, you know, because I agree with you. It's, it's just not a blanket issue. And mm -hmm. it's just not, it's, it's so complex, but it influenced the way that I, I see things. But yes, I, I paint everything from intuition. I, I really believe that. I, I'm so glad to hear that because I, I, so much can, when you use your intuition, you see something different in a person that they may not see or recognize. And this is what I'm picking up in that. And when they see it, all of a sudden it activates them internally at their core. Yes. And that helps them make the transition. I don't know if you realize that. Yes. yes. Good. Good. I'm glad because the fact is, is that that's how many people can be. They're affected by colors and taste and smells and sight and yep. their hearing. But the fact is, is something subliminal so much so is like a painting or a drawing 
or just a comment can can get them to a point that they reevaluate and reflect. And that is amazing because that's where most people nowadays don't do. They don't reflect. They just jump at the response instead yes. of taking that pause. Hyper reactivity. Yes. Yes, it is. So it the, is shame because it steals your energy and it mm -hmm. steals your power. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's why all of us are here mm -hmm. is to help them help guide them back through our divine messages the, and gifts that'll help heal. Well, in law enforcement, I had to go about it differently. Nobody knew my gifts. Nobody knew my talents. Nobody knew my near-death experiences. Nobody knew my pre premonitions. Nobody knew the things that I had done. It was an absolute duality. It's okay. all about the facts over here. And over here, it's like, you want to tell me that story again? Because there's something missing here. <laughs> so when you become this walking lie detector, but you can't tell anybody why or for, how come. Yes. And it's... Uh, it's a, it's a difficult road to walk, but it's, it's something that I embraced because I was able to work with troubled youth and none of them knew my background. None of them knew who I was. None of them knew that I had gone through much more than they've experienced. And so all of a sudden that 15 years at that high school, I, it, it's, I always treasured it, but now that I'm doing the podcast and they're watching the podcast, they're hitting me up in email going, I didn't know. I don't think anybody was prepared for you. I don't think anybody knew you worked in gangs. I don't think, you know, it was just, they just didn't understand my background. So, um, but it was um, rewarding as, as much as it was difficult yes. and trying to help kids figure out what they're doing and allowing them to be inspired and empowered to choose something different than the society norms. Okay. I lived a life because, or I lived the consequences because of society norms. My father was Native American, my mother was white. And at the time in the 60s, right. you didn't get divorced. It was taboo, not for the male, but for the female. Mm -hmm. And so the fact is, is it's like, okay, well, I, I, I lived that and I was one of those kids, but again, it's not who defined me. Mm. It's how you walk your mile. Yes. And change the subject, change the subject, but <laughs> how are you doing with all the stuff going on around you right now with this tornado that just hit five States? I, I evidently it's the longest tornado on the ground yeah. In history, it was on the ground for over 200 miles. Yeah. Can, I, can you talk about your experience? I mean, just I, I know my listeners are just wanting to know how and what you experienced through all this, because it was on the ground and came close to your house, did it not? It, it, it got close. It was um, about, about seven miles north of us. It actually, I had a lot of prayers that came through and it took an arc right around where we are and came back mm -hmm. through. So it was amazing, but we still had the experience of the winds. I could hear it. Yes. I, things got relocated and that was, it was terrifying. I mean, you know, no doubt about it, uh, preparing the house putting people in the, in the bathroom, being ready for, you know, the worst case scenario. And then the power went out and that mm. you know, my heart's pounding and, and I pick up on energy. So these storms, when they come through with that intensity, you know, my body's mm. just lit up and I'm just very sorry for all of those that were affected, you know, negatively that were injured and, and died. It, and yes, I was shocked at how long this thing was on the ground and how mm -hmm. far it traveled mm -hmm. with the intensity that it did. It was yes, incredible. Um, so yeah, it's, it, you know, I, I'm still thinking about it. I'm sure, I'm sure. And it'll probably be in your aura for a while just because it's, it's trying to find everybody that's missing now or the people mm -hmm. that were buried under the debris. And the businesses that people were working when this, when this tornado hit and 
there was a candle factory. There was an Amazon distribution center where there was like a hundred people working when this yeah. happened and didn't know it was coming. So they had no idea. They were just going about their night. So yes, I, I honor all of those that are going through this. I honor you for your, for you going through this and be able to talk about it today. But I also send out my prayers and my love for all the families that have endured or lost someone in this, this time. Yes. And I, I just ask my listeners to, if you can help, help. If you can send a donation, even if it's a dollar, you don't know how much that dollar could mean to somebody when they have nothing. Oh boy. Yes. So Katana, I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank you for sharing your message with me and with my podcast and with all of my subscribers. And it has been an honor to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their thoughts and ideas and turn it into their reality. Katana has done that. She stepped past her fears. She stayed the course and had the courage to go through the follow through all the way to the end. Katana Malawinski, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, and your dreams with us today.